Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, Kim ki action films and earrings. We'll look at the reaction to filmmaker Kim ki death. Then, Mila Jovovich leads yet another high-octane video game adaptation. And, accessory designer mimics Zaha Hadid's iconic buildings. Controversial movie maker Kim ki Duk has died due to complications from the coronavirus. Reports say he was in Riga for a new film project. Kim has left a filmography that spans three decades, and he is one of the few directors in cinema to have won awards at all the big three festivals, Cannes, Berlin and Venice. In a moment, we'll talk to a film scholar about Kim's career. But first, let's revisit an interview I did with him last year when Kim was in Istanbul for the Bosphorus Film Festival. Kim Kiduk. What a great pleasure to host you on our show today. Thank you so much for joining us. So let's start with this. Everywhere, on the internet, in your um, film critics, everywhere, when I look at you, you are held as a controversial director, controversial filmmaker. And I have a feeling that you're actually sort of even sometimes embracing this. Uh, so it makes me think about whether you actually claim this title and claim this role and whether you think a filmmaker's role is to be controversial and create controversy from time to time. Oh, uh, well, yes, of course I know people watching my films can have opposing ideas, but I've never done this on purpose or to deliberately spark such discussions. I've made my thoughts into movies with the purest intentions, but it's natural that there are contradictions between those who love my work and those who don't. It wasn't my intention, but the film may have created opposing feelings in the audience. I think it's a good thing that there are contradictions between the audience and the critics after the film is made. So, considering the fact that I think your cinema is all about um, the coexistence of different poles, black and white, um, light and dark, like light and shadow or sorrow and hope, you know, um, considering this, do you think it's harder to be a director now that the world is suffering from, I don't know, the rise of far-right terror and the war on terror? So do you feel like it is a good time to be a filmmaker? Uh, uh... Of course, there are a wide variety of types of films. These might be humanistic, comedies or political films. I think things like wars, terror attacks and conflicts between countries influence us more. One of the most recent films I made was The Net, a film about the South and North Korean conflict, but it was not supposed to judge which party was right or wrong. I think that cinema, instead of taking sides, should tell the story of mutual understanding of what the real problem is. In this regard, I respect being gray rather than being black or white. I prefer to look at things from the gray side and forgive or make a compromise. Something a bit more personal. I wonder if you watch a lot of movies, because I've met a lot of directors who take pride in not watching a lot of movies, and they don't call themselves cinephiles because they probably believe that it's um, too intellectual to be immersed so much in the uh, discipline. Are you like that? It's been 25 years since I started making movies. I didn't have a chance to see many movies while making my first film. I didn't have any formal education, so I didn't know much about cinema. But as I made more and more films, I started to wonder what other directors' films were like. Five or six years after making my first movie, I examined these directors' old movies, especially movies many people see as a masterpiece. Apart from that, I also examined the films of other good directors that were my contemporaries. This has influenced my own movies. So would you say that you belong to South Korean um, cinema tradition or South Korean new wave per se? Uh, I can say I've thought about this a lot of times. I was born in South Korea and made films there, but I'd rather be called a film director than a South Korean film director because my films are released in many countries. So I'm just a film director. 
But then there are a lot of filmmakers who would identify with a genre or with a, a country, with a nationality. So do you sometimes maybe take pride in being the outsider or feeling like the outsider? I don't think that way. Of course, I was born in South Korea, but because I always make a lot of films about the conflicts or problems involving other people, I don't really think we should call these films Korean films, just because they were made in Korea. Since we all have a lot of information at our disposal on a global level today, I also think I'm a director who makes global movies. I recently made a film called Human, Space, Time and Human. It was shown at this festival as well. It's a film about the problems we all have nowadays and universal energy. It doesn't belong to any country, but to all humanity. As you just said, it's a film with opposing ideas. Some people said it was natural and some said it was pure and beautiful. So speaking of universality, do you watch um, superhero movies like Marvel movies, for example? I'm a film director, but I also have a film production company. I always want a movie to be watched on the big screen by a lot of people. Therefore, I'm a director. But as a producer, I think it's necessary to gather information through measuring what the audience is interested in. That's why I watch many commercial industrial films, such as American Marvel films and some European films. As a filmmaker, I think I should watch these films in terms of gathering information about filmmaking without thinking whether I like them or not. But lately, uh, Martin Scorsese and Francis Ford Coppola, they dismissed these movies. Uh, Scorsese actually even said that they're not real cinema. What do you think about that? Do you think it is real cinema, uh, superhero movies, these days? Uh, I never want to talk rationally about a director's film, but as everything else in the world has a market, cinema also needs its market. And if we think that there is a demand for these films, I think it's only natural to make them. Any hero movie, whether from Marvel Studios or not, may be necessary for children or people in general. People have a good time watching these movies. That's why I can't easily say these movies are good or bad. On the contrary, I respect people who can easily speak their mind and evaluate my films as good or bad. I have been a film director for 25 years, and I make a movie every year. It's my dream to make a film every year, whether it's screened or not. I'm a film worker. Being a worker always requires one to work, so it's always my goal to make a movie every year. What's more, I'm happiest when I make movies and write screenplays. I'm very happy to know that someone is watching my films somewhere in the world. Well, it was great having you on our show today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. I am so happy to have been to this film festival. I hope this festival in Turkey becomes more popular and more and more people watch the movies screened here. We're now joined by film scholar and critic Jason Besherways, who's a professor at Shungchil Cyber University. Hi there, it's good to have you on Showcase today. Thanks a lot for joining us. So, we just Hello. said that um, Kim ki was definitely a festival circuit darling. He, uh, he got all the three big prizes um, at Cannes, Berlin and Venice. So, tell us what you think his secret was when it comes to captivating uh, the European festival circuit. Well, it's interesting. Um, he certainly, I mean, his films certainly introduced Korean cinema to Western audiences, um, certainly uh, in the, the early kind of noughties. And uh, uh, Pieter in 2013 won The Golden Lion. Um, I, I think his, I mean, he's an uncom un uncompromising filmmaker. Um, I mean, his use of uh, cinematography uh, and also the way he was able to um used minimal dialogue um but made his film strangely hypnotic uh but i think for for me though i, I find his films problematic i find them quite mis I, i find them very misogynistic um and uh, the reaction in korea i think has been quite different compared to the west um before we get certainly... into that jason sorry to cut you off there tell me why you think his his film style is controversial, apart from what he does on sets. This, this, that's a different topic, of course. But I wonder why you think his films are problematic. 
Well, I, his films are misogynistic. I mean, he, the way he portrays women and the violence inflicted on them. Um, and I think what we've, what has been documented, I mean, through this documentary, uh, this NBC documentary that aired in 2018, his, uh, his behavior towards women was just outrageous. Um, and we see w female characters in the film um, subjected to uh, sexual assault, violence, um, and as I mean, these two things are related. And uh, there is the argument you can separate uh, the director or the artist from the artwork. But um, for me, it becomes problematic um, the way he depicts women in particular uh, and his behaviour on set. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jason, so, well, his films are definitely divisive and some just see them as very, very bold portrayal of extreme violence, which is a part of life. That's what they say. What do you think about this argument? Do you think that kind of uh, violence, you know, actually exists in life and that is what Kim ki is putting on, uh, you know, show? Well, yeah, I, I agree he's uncompromising, but he's also exploitative. And um, I think he's he's certainly uh, found um, an audience on the festival circuit in Europe uh, that are very fond of his films. Uh, but uh, like I said, uh, I think his his uh, betrayal, uh, his it, well, themes that he adopts in his films, incredibly misogynistic, mm -hmm. uh, human space, human is... His most recent film was uh, very difficult for me to watch, um, and uh, having heard or having read and watched, watched the documentary and read the reports, it, for me it made me very, very uncomfortable. Um, and uh, I think uh, there are victims, and we must remember those and be conscious that of those that he he he's he's, uh, he's inflicted much much harm on and. Uh, uh, I think uh, it's, it's, it's an issue for many people here in Korea, but also um, everywhere, really, having uh, heard, heard these reports uh, uh, that, uh, of, these, uh, of his behavior on set. And yes, his, his films do delve into uh, very difficult issues. And there is the argument that he's, he's uncompromising and he's depicting, uh, he's depicting violence, but... Uh, uh, I, I think one can't uh, separate the, just the, what's happened on his film sets uh, okay. and the way he depicts women in his films. So you're actually suggesting that huge art house uh, festivals like Cannes, uh, Berlinale and Venice, they're actually missing something in drawing the line between uncompromising and exploitative. Uh, yeah, I think it was. It was uh, I think Berlin uh, inviting human space time human was was uh, was outrageous. If if I'm absolutely frank, um, uh, given the the Me Too movement and and what it's what it's done to uh, bring light to uh, just the, the, uh, I mean certainly the uh, the difficulties facing women on set and, and the lack of representation. Um, and for them to screen that film, for me, was very problematic. Okay, so you were mentioning that uh, in his home country, his repetition is much worse than uh, in the West or especially Europe. Tell me about the reactions in South Korea after his death. Um, I think uh, it's been muted, for sure. I think uh, his reputation um, certainly as a filmmaker, but also as, as, as someone with a really bad, re an awful reputation on set and the way he depicts women. Um, so yes, it's not been, uh, they certainly haven't glorified him. Um, and uh, uh, I think a lot, there have been uh, lots of tweets and uh, in, in the reports of, uh, that, are, that have circulated following the news of his death. Uh, that that have um, talked about the issues and the difficulties facing uh, women on set and the accusations that he faced, um, and so. But of course, there are those who have uh, a voice their support, uh, a voice their their their, their um, uh, the sadness of him passing. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that. 
by and large in Korea, it's far more muted than it has been overseas. All right. As for one last question, because we're running out of time, uh, I understand your concerns and your reaction against uh, his controversial uh, reputation. But then we have the strong filmography here. So I wonder where you think he stands uh, in uh, South Korean film tradition. I mean, uh, Parasite's success, for example. I mean, was it a one-off success or do you think uh, this was in the building and mostly due to Kim ki international success? Oh, no, I, I don't think Parasite's success has got anything to do with Kim ki -duk. Um I mean, l looking at Parasite, uh, and Bong Joon-ho is a very, very different filmmaker. Um, uh, the, the films of Bong Joon-ho, uh, if you look at his films, they strongly uh, correlate with uh, wider developments in the Korean film industry. Barking Dogs Never Bite was, was uh, released at a time when directors were given much creative control, um, much like Kim ki uh, actually. But where Bong joon is very different, you've got Memories of Murder, it was released in 2003, a very significant year for Korean cinema. We have Pak chang um, uh, Old Boy, Jang jun won Save the Green Planet, Im sang Su's The Good Lawyer's Wife. Then in 2006, we have uh, the host, uh, this kind of quintessential Korean blockbuster, and then Mother, and then which is a, which, which is a big hit on the festival circuit, um, and then Snowpiercer and Okja, which were hugely significant films mm -hmm. for the Korean film industry, and then of course Snowpiercer, as then of course Parasite. So, um, I, I, I mean, yes, Kim ki has certainly introduced um, many programmers and critics and audiences to Korean cinema. I, I don't deny that, uh, but has he yeah. had an impact on? Parasite and the success of Parasite? Absolutely not. All right. It was good to have you on Showcase today, Jason Bashevis. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for having me. The talent and crew behind Resident Evil are at it again. This time, they're bringing to the screen Monster Hunter. It could be the next big video game adaptation, but will lightning strike twice for the filmmakers? Let's find out. Monster Hunter tells the story of Officer Natalie Artemis and her elite strike force. They fall through a portal and have to fight for survival in a world full of monsters. The movie's a bit like the $1.2 billion grossing Resident Evil franchise. The same franchise that turned Mila Jovovich into an action star and gave her husband, Paul W.S. Anderson, a career boost. Now the whole family is back together again. Jovovich and Anderson are joining forces with German production company Constantin Film, Canada's Impact Pictures, and U.S.'s very own Screen Gems once again. This time, they also have a new partner in crime the Mac Daddy of Munster movies, and home of Godzilla, Toho Studios. And with Sony Pictures releasing, once again resuming worldwide distribution duties, it looks like nothing can stand between Monster Hunter and Jaggernaut ticket sales, right? Well, no. Monster Hunter has been withdrawn from Chinese cinemas just a day after its release because a pun involving the words knees in Chinese was deemed offensive. And it is also being review-bombed by the masses for this reason. The makers of the movie announced their intention was not to disrespect anyone, and said that the particular moment in the film would be removed for the re-release. This alteration has affected the remaining release dates. And even though apologies were handed out, the backlash from one of the world's biggest movie markets seems to be a bit scarier than the monsters themselves. Zaha Hadid is considered one of the greatest architects of all time. So, it's no surprise architects seek inspiration from her. Except one has taken a step in a different direction. The late Zaha Hadid has been called the queen of the curve for her architectural designs. And now her style is reflected in these rather tiny pieces. They're the designs of Basant Magdi Abu Zaid, 
She's an architect, and although her deed was the reason she became one in the first place, she's not interested in making buildings. I'm using this style in jewelry. I don't feel the need to create buildings. The difference between architecture and fashion is that the design is implemented on a smaller space, so we can put our creativity into it and the result would be faster and easier. It may take an hour to make the design, but it will need five to ten years to build a building like Zaha Hadid's. And once she puts her ideas on paper, she heads to a workshop where she has them made. This is a new thing that is not available in the market. Things that are available now are the typical designs. But her pieces haven't been seen before. And when we make unique items, they become special. Abu Zaid's first collection focused on earrings, but she wants to feature Hadid's sleek lines and curves in other accessories too. Today we started executing the new collection. I have two collections. The first one was Zaha Hadid, named after her, and each design was named after a building designed by her. Today we're making the second part of the collection, because the first one was only earrings, and I wanted to expand my work and make belts, bracelets and rings and all the other accessories. She adds that she'll continue to explore the connection between fashion and architecture, and perhaps one day Abu Zaid will no longer need the support she gets from Hadid's work. Artist Cevdet Erek is inspired by an ancient monument and it's been a complicated love affair across Western Anatolia, Berlin, St. Petersburg and Istanbul. Here's Sena with more. This 2,000-year-old Pergamon altar somehow has refashioned into this. It's called Bergama Stereotype. Turkish artist Cevdet Erek first exhibited a version of the installation in Berlin but a few changes have been made. Each speaker here is playing a different sound. I can hear the drums, I can hear bells, I can hear a man breathing very heavily. It's almost like he's chanting. This is a surround experience of sound and space. As much as it's overwhelming, it's also very confusing. And I need a little bit of help to digest. So, let's take it from the top, from the title Bergama. It's an ancient city located in Izmir, on the western Turkish coastline. And the star of this Acropolis, the great altar of Zeus, has gone through some rough times. In 1625, the English economist and philosopher William Petty took parts of the altar to England. More than 200 years later, Ottoman Sultan Abdul Hamid II allowed the rest of it to go to Germany. It was moved to a bunker during the World War II, then taken by the Soviets, who moved it to St. Petersburg. It was returned to Berlin in 1958, and it's currently under renovation for the next three years. For a monument this big, it's bizarre how the altar has always been on the go. One of the main questions was how to bring, what to bring from the original work, which also kind of sets the title, Bergama Stereotype. Stereotype, if you remember, stereotype comes from printing, older uh, way of printing. To duplicate, to make it a duplicate of an image or many duplicates, you prepare something solid, so you make printing. And looking for a solid impression of the altar was tough. Eric had to go through archival pictures, architectural plans, and examine how the monument was depicted in other artworks. If we could really think like a, a translation of a book, mm -hmm. we uh, genera generally think of translation as a movement and a transition of an, you know, a, a content in an original language to another language. And when we talk here and we say Bergama stereotype, we know what it means. It's also like in the street, you know, stereotype, would be stereotype. So, uh, I think in, in not being translated, it also keeps something from its home. And it's, by not being translated, not being translated, it, it also gives something from that home to the other home. Erik is also a musician, so what his installation gives is written in sound and rhythm. 
in visual arts, in contemporary arts, still the visual, even in the installations, visual is the main source. Maybe it's also an attempt to not to close your eyes and listen to something, or not to be deaf and only look at things, but to try to make a balance. And here, as you see, even though we have these huge loudspeakers, it's not a very loud work, so we can work, we can talk like that. Uh, because we were not wishing to make a dominating effect with very loud voices. Just behind this wall you have it everywhere anyways. The sounds of Bergama stereotype remind us of this. Every act of repetition creates an alteration. Also the possibility of change and novelty. We're going to get interpretations of other people. Uh, then we're going to start to learn about the work and what it could evoke also. So that's the important part also, that's uh, open to interpretation of audience, always. Thank God, both Eric and Ansan were pretty articulate and gave us something to start from. Sena Arslan, TRT World, Istanbul. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of art and culture. I'm Elif Bereketli, thanks for watching, bye for now.